And uh, we have Willie Hutchison with us this morning. I don't know whether you were, you remember Willie being here the last time. I think he was mentioning Dodi Weir, uh, one of his friends. Uh, but uh, he's got a Marks and Spencer's bag with him. It comes from Straven, you know. And uh, it's not weak, so she's it's not weak. <laughs> and uh, I'll be interested to see what's in this bag this morning. So Willie's going to come up for a short talk with us. You might uh, want to take your uh, masks off. You don't need to, but you, for this children's talk, Graham will be taking some photographs. He's promised some uh, soft focus on some of the photographs. So, Well, good morning to you. I have to say, it's like the Hilton when I came in this morning. <laughs> I haven't seen your church since it was uh, done up. This is fantastic. And I went to the uh, counter there at the kitchen, asked for a cheeseburger, chips and a Coke. And I was told it was £3.50. So there we are. You're obviously doing well. I don't know if you remember this. You won't remember this. But last time I was here, I told a rugby story uh, surrounding Dory Weir. Well, if we told a rugby story, it's got to be football this time. So um, just looking around, there's a young man sitting uh, at the back there. Do you like football? You know, yes, I'm um, just looking at you, looking at me and saying, who's the old guy that's talking to me? No, he, and he's shaking his head, he doesn't like football. Right, that's fine. We've got a jolly good start. Right, there we are. Here's the story. History repeats itself. So obviously we're talking football. And just so happens I've got a ball here, which uh, uh, people have offered to buy from me many times. It's, uh, I don't know if you can see the symbols there, but when Gordon was ill, the, the folks in the government got together and signed a ball and all sorts of things for him and gave this to him. So I'll have be at the door, the highest bidder. No church has managed to reach that summit yet, but uh, if you want to buy it, it's there. But here's the story. History repeats itself. When I was growing up in the east end of Glasgow, we lived in a cul-de-sac. A cul-de-sac, as you know, is uh, there's nobody at the end of it and we're a wall. And my I've got two older brothers and my older brother and I, the middle one, we used to play Wally. Do you know what Wally is? Oh, this is going to mark you well, isn't it? Yeah, Wally. We you hit the ball and it comes back to you and you keep hitting it and backwards and forwards. So there we were, out in the cul-de-sac, we're hitting his ball. Now, I want you to imagine the ball's coming. Think of the best football you've ever known. Ronaldo. John Gregg, Scott Brown, whoever it might be, the ball came to my foot. And I hit the ball. And the ball soared towards the wall. Sadly, the ball went over the wall. <laughs> but not only that, my dear mother was sitting in the living room. She was reading the people's friend. I know it should have been the Bible, but it was a people's friend. And she was reading that, and the ball, this without a word of a lie, came to the top window of our little house there, went through the window, <laughs> and landed right in my mother's lap. <laughs> She's been in the glory for lots of years, not because of that, I have to say, but uh, she has been. She's been in heaven for oh, more than 30 years now. But you know what she did? She came to the door and said, William! That was the best shot I've ever seen you do. <laughs> do you think she did? No. no. As you know, parents at that stage had wooden spoons. <laughs> and they're not allowed to talk about this anymore, but she did a thing with a wooden spoon that you wouldn't do anymore, and you get five years for it. <laughs> History repeats itself. We've got three sons. David, our oldest, is remarkably keen in football. And he played out in the front garden with a guy who played for Scotland and lived across the road from us. And David was always in the front garden kicking the ball about, hoping that Mr. So-and-so would come out. He never did. But there we were. My dear wife and I, Agnes, were in the kitchen. And we were washing the dishes. <clears throat> Just throw that in, Jim. Washing the dishes. <laughs> and doing all sorts of things. When we heard, <laughs> what do you think had happened? I kind of hear from this screen. What do you think had happened? <laughs> The, you're absolutely right so you're going to have to come and help me no I'm only kidding <laughs> no the ball we went through thinking that's what had happened but what had happened was this boys and girls at the back here's what my big boy was doing he was standing going like that now David's got one or two issues but I've never known him to do that before 
And in his eye was a wee tear. And he was looking down. And do you know what had happened? <laughs> Here's what it happened. Because I cleaned the windows in the morning, <clears throat> Jim, take a note of that. And the windows were sparkling, and we bought to flown along. Oh, that was pretty good, actually. <laughs> Not when the Glasgow church you say, oh, too bad, pal. Yeah, you go. <laughs> we bought to flown along, hit the window, and hit the ground. Now, here's what we did. With all our hamsters and goldfish and all sorts of things, we take them round the back and we bury them. And we always sing, this is a day that the Lord has made. I don't know why we do that, but we do that. But at night, here's the thing. Boys and girls, this is just for you. I was tucking the boys in and telling a story about the ball that didn't hit the window. It was a wee bird. I said, boys, remember that wee bird that hit the window? The Bible talks about it. And there's a wee verse in Matthew 10 that says this. Two sparrows just sold for a penny. And yet God knows about it. And I said, boys, if two sparrows were sold for a penny and God knows about them, how much more does he know about you? Older folks, young folks, God knows about you. God loves you. And God cares for you. It goes on to say God even knows how many hairs are on our head. That's a bit of a doddle for God with this. And this man here. But for some of us who get fine heads of hair, it's slightly more complicated. But that's how, amen, brother. That's how much, that's how much God knows about us. So young folks, I want you to think about this. Maybe not very good at sport. Maybe not very good at school. Maybe bullied a bit. Maybe something not quite right. God loves you just the way you are. And God wants to care for you and all the folks, wherever we're at, in all our different circumstances. If he cares for two wee sparrows, just think how much he cares for us. God bless. And I meant to say, I meant to say, you know how footballers always celebrate? They do all sorts of things. Well, lots of celebrations here. I was going to give them to Jim here. But he, he tells me he's on a diet. So, uh, so he's not getting them. So I would like that girl there. See, could you come and take it and take it to Sunday club and you can share it over the next few weeks. Don't eat them all today or mom and dad will not be happy with me. Okay. So you take that, Jim. Thank you for listening. There we are. There we go. You go and share that. That's a girl. Love that. Good. Thank you, Willie. Um, so, and they want the dishes done or their windows clean. <laughs> it's Second Peter um, chapter one. We're reading from verses five to nine. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with goodness, and goodness with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective and unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Thank you. Thank you, Beverly. And so we're going to uh, ask Willie to come and uh, give us God's word, but let's Come with a prayerful attitude um, as we um, invite Willie up to the platform. We'll just have a, a moment of prayer. Um, our God and Father, it's indeed a great privilege to hear your word. It's a great responsibility as well. And we pray for help for Willie that he will bring faithfully your word this morning and help us to uh, respond appropriately. And we pray for your blessing upon this service as we will just wait on you. Amen.
Well, thank you so much for, uh, again, the welcome and uh, thank you for cooperating so well with the Children's Talk for all ages. But I'm a great believer that church should be a place of happiness and joy. And just uh, it's okay to uh, have a bit of fun as well because our God is a great God and he's interested in all the circumstances. Thank you for the Bible reading. We're uh, going to illustrate that uh, thought for the day of perseverance or steadfastness. And uh, let me illustrate it this way. Every year we go to the island of Skye, and of course that was knocked in the head for a couple of years, but we managed to get up just about three weeks ago, and we always set ourselves a challenge. We've been going since the boys were young, so now it's just uh, she and me go up together. We always set ourselves a challenge. One is to find somewhere new to eat, and the other is a new walk, which we haven't done before. Nothing significant, I hasten to add, but a new walk. This year, I managed again to find somewhere new to eat. The chip shops are getting better for my dear wife. And she also found a new walk, which was in Dunvegan. And there's a walk at the back of Dunvegan called the Two Churches Walk. It starts, if you're ever in there, opposite the little Christian fellowship, which meets in the relatively new shopping centre that's there. And it starts at the Church of Scotland, goes up round the back and ends up at Kilmure Church, the old church. There's a lady nodding here. You maybe uh, know it quite well. Yes. And as you go into that, as it ends up in the Kilmure Church, we were there. And there was two Americans, two American tourists there from Virginia. And not being short of a word or two, we ended up chatting to them. And in the graveyard of the church, we were wandering around and the Virginian lady said to me, there's a sense of spirituality here, isn't there? Oh, we had a bit of a chat, and we ended up going for tea with them later on, but that's another story. But as we looked, there was one particular stone embedded in the wall. It was for Flora McLeod. She was born on the 3rd of February, 1878. She died on the 4th of November, 1976. She was the 28th chief of the clan MacLeod. And at the bottom of the stone were two words, hold fast. And as I looked around at the other MacLeod stones, they all had the words hold fast. If your son name is MacLeod, I think you know your clan motto is hold fast. And if you don't, shame on you. So we ended up talking to this American couple about, would you believe, Christian things. Talked about COVID and Scotland and the US, and then we talked about Hold Fast. There was a gospel song that the Gettys are famous for singing. It reads like this. When I fear, my faith will fail. Christ will hold me fast. He will not let my soul be lost. His promises shall last Bought by him at such a cost, he will hold me fast. Let me illustrate steadfastness or perseverance with a story from the Old Testament. Let me just read it to you. It's about Elijah. We're in 1 Kings 19. Now Ahab told Jezebel, Ahab was a king, Jezebel was a queen. Everything Elijah, who was a prophet of God at that time, Everything he'd done and how he'd killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods, with a small g, deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like one of them. In other words, you're a wanted man, Elijah. We're coming to get you. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. And when he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there, while he himself went a day's journey into the desert. He came to a broom tree or a juniper tree, sat down under it and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the tree and fell asleep. All at once, here's the phrase for the day, for perseverance and steadfastness. All at once, an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around and there by his head was a cake of bread, Baked over hot coals and a jar of water, he ate and drank and then lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank, and strengthened by that food, he traveled for 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. 
And there he went into a cave and spent the night. And the word of the Lord came again to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? Perseverance. Many, even perhaps in this audience, are struggling to persevere and hold fast this morning. Because of the last 19 months we've had, the enthusiasm's gone, Christian things, the desire to read our Bible, to pray, to get involved in church things, it's taking a big dip. And we're not quite holding fast. We're not quite as steadfast as we used to be. That's where we are with Elijah sitting under this juniper tree. He's had it. He's had enough. Now, let's just analyze Elijah for one minute. He was a brave man. He'd stood before the king, King Ahab, who was an ungodly man, but he stood before him and told him what would happen. He'd confronted the prophets of Baal and Mount Carmel. he challenged this wicked king, Queen Jezebel. He'd prayed for the withholding of rain. Sometimes I wish he was with me today. I do say that. He'd prayed for the withholding of rain, but it happened. He'd prayed for fire to come down, and it happened miraculous things. And in Luke 9, we find that he appears on a mountaintop with Moses and the Lord Jesus. This was some Christian who had been holding fast, who had been totally persevering. Where did we find him? This great man of faith and courage and prayer and faithfulness. He's sitting down saying, I've had it. It could just be. It could just be that's where we might be this morning. We're hanging on by our fingertips. We felt down. We felt isolated. We felt, is God really in this? And we're not holding fast. We're not steadfast anymore. But here's a wee phrase. All at once, the angel touched him. What a lovely phrase. First of all, it was a gracious touch. I'm a brethren boy, so I've got five points. You always got to at least three points if you're a brethren boy. I've got five. First one was a gracious touch. What God did not do. He could have touched him with punishment. After all, what God had done for him. He provided him with food at the brook at Kerith. Remember that? That's a great story. The birds flying in with the meat and the bread provided for him. Then a widow at Zarephath. They'd been fed and watered and given lodgings there. He'd been protected from this wicked Queen Jezebel. He'd had his prayers answered supernaturally. So God could have said, look, I've done all that for you. So be it. If that's what you want, but here he is. He's wallowing in self-pity. God could have said, well, if that's it, I'm finished with you. Could have killed him. That's what he wanted. Take my life, he said. You see, the great thing about our God is this. For yourself and myself. Our God is the God of the first chance, the second chance, the third chance, and the fourth chance. Our God wants us to come back to him. And it could be we're drifting. And we need that gracious touch of God to say, I'm coming back. Remember the old gospel hymn, Lord, I'm coming home? That's what it's like. To come back, I want to hold fast. I want to persevere. Thank you for your gracious touch. Psalm 103 verse 10 says this. The Lord does not deal with us as our sins deserve. If he did, we'd be lost, folks. What a wonderful hymn we sang at the beginning, as Jim rightly said. My sin, oh, the bliss of the glorious thought is nailed not in part but the whole. God doesn't deal with us as our sins deserve. He's a mighty God who forgives if we come to him and encourages us to hold fast. So it was a gracious touch. But it was also a caring touch. You notice that? We've missed that over recent months. We've missed the hugs and the pecking the cheek and the shaking of hands and all that sort of thing. Our wee grandchildren come and visit, and during the height of it, they weren't quite sure what to do. They came running in and wanted to hug grandma. And their mum was saying, oh dear, and we said, oh, forget that, come on, give us a hug. And they're up in the knee and all the rest of it. But we've missed that social contact. Just the assurance that somebody's there for you. Just the assurance that they would do anything for you. We've missed that because we've been a bit isolated. I kept working all the way through uh, lockdown. Some days I was virtually the only person in West George Street or West Regent Street in Glasgow. Strange, it was surreal. 
We'll miss the human contact. It's good to care. I wonder if you're encouraging somebody to hold fast and to persevere by caring for them. There's an old magazine called The Believer's Magazine. I don't know if any of you ever remember it. It was around Brethren Assemblies. I think it's still going. I got sent a text a few months ago. I'd never read this before. It was from a 1966 edition of this magazine. And it was about my grandpa, who I very uh, hardly knew because I was so young. But it said this. He was a doorkeeper in Summerfield Hall. That was a church in the west end of Glasgow. He was a doorkeeper there. He was loved and respected for his kindly, caring words of encouragement. He was never, ever up doing things like this. You know what he was? He was at the door, apparently. He was at the door just saying hello to folks. And gently in the way out saying, how are you doing? Could you be that person for somebody to encourage them to hold fast and to keep going? Because that is, if not, or as important, if not more important than doing this. They mean a one in one with somebody. Hebrews 1 and 4 says this, angels are sent to care for God's elect. Are you that angel? I'm looking down. I see many angels sitting right in front of me. You could be that person. So how did Elijah get here? How did he How did he get to this place where he'd been holding fast? He'd been a steadfast Christian. He'd been one of these people you would look at and say, wow, when I grow up, I want to be like Elijah. How did he get there? Well, he was thought that everybody was against him. He felt afraid, depressed, deserted. Quite simply, he felt a failure. He'd hoped for great things that didn't happen. After that event in Mount Carmel, which is a brilliant children's story, as well as a wonderful theological story, he thought everything would be great, but it wasn't. The whole country didn't turn back to God after that, so he felt a failure. He's not alone, of course, and maybe you've been there. Remember Job, he cursed the day of his birth. Jeremiah in chapter 20, verse 14, he also cursed the day he was born. The great David, King David, the writer of the Psalms, he said this, my tears have been my food night and day. You know, when we get low, we say silly things, don't we? We become a very rational. I think Elijah here had lost his experimental faith, not his saving faith. I don't believe you can lose that if you're truly born again and I hope you are this morning as we come to church, have the knowledge of Jesus in your life. I think once you've done that, you can't lose it. But you can lose the experimental faith, as I call it, daily living for Jesus. And then the angel comes with a gracious touch, but it was also, did you notice, a practical touch. I'm a great believer in this, that to encourage folks to hold fast and to persevere You've got to show God's love in a practical way before you can actually tell them that God loves them. Folks have got to see that we're real and genuine, and I'm so delighted to see your coffee shop, for example, where the community, I guess, come in for coffee and buns, and you're sharing with them. You're not preaching, you're just sharing. And that practical touch comes along. And did you note there was no sermon? He didn't give them three points in the tabernacle. What he did was he gave them food and sleep. We had our three young grandchildren staying with us last night. I want you to pray for me today. (laughs) They call it a sleepover. I call it an over. Forget the sleep. I passed the living team last night. Can we go and play downstairs, Gramps? Don't think so, son. Five o'clock this morning without the word of a lie. It's morning time. (laughs) I don't think so, son. You see, sleep is a wonderful thing, isn't it? I don't understand why folk don't like sleep. But you see, that's what Elijah needed. Because you see, he'd been busy earnestly praying. And if you really pray, it's tiring. He'd been busy executing the prophets of Baal, that Mount Carmel story. It's a stunning story. That's physical activity. And then, listen to this, you who jog and run and run marathons. He'd run 18 miles before Ahab's chariot. 
It ran another 90 miles south of Beersheba. He left his servant there and another 20 miles into the desert. He was physically exhausted. For somebody who can't run around the block, that is a real hero. That's what he was. He was physically exhausted. And he needed food. And what does God do through his angel? He says, Elijah, I want you to hold fast, son. I want you to keep going. Here's some food. Here's some drink. And have a good sleep. Sometimes that can be a real issue for us. We feel tempted to say, yes, I can do it. Yes, I can do it. Yes, I can do it. Sometimes we need to say, no, I'm sorry. It's actually, it's time to say no. In a very gentle way. Not being awkward, but time to say, no, I'm sorry. That's just a bridge too far. Because you see, we can become physically, spiritually exhausted. And God comes along with that practical touch and saying, actually, what you need is this. You need a wee holiday. You need to take a break. You need to stop and just recharge the batteries, as I call it. That's what Elijah did. And perhaps if you're struggling to hold fast and be steadfast this morning, maybe that's the problem. I don't like modern phrases or trendy phrases like burn out, but maybe that's what's happening. And you just need to stop and take stock and hold fast, and look for God's practical touch. And then there's the personal touch. Did you notice that? When I came in today, Ken Newbury was at the door. I didn't know whether to shake hands or give him a hug or do anything, so I just said hi. <laughs> but that's where we are. I met a chap for lunch in West George Street just uh, during the week, and he was walking behind me and said, hi, where were I turned around immediately shook his hand, and then we were holding each other's hand and said, oh, dear, what have we done? <laughs> You see, that is where we're at. It's personal, it's natural. You know, in our church, we used to sort of uh, give folks a wee hug in the morning. Now, if you go in with three feet, folks of each other, it's whoa! (laughs) But you see, there's that caring to encourage folks to hold fast and to persevere. In itself, it's nothing, but actually it is quite something. To let folks know that you care. Now, I don't believe this angel was one with shining lights and big wings. I believe it was just somebody like us who came alongside and touched him. What makes me think that? Well, there's a lovely story in Genesis 18 about Abraham. He was out in his garden and three folks arrived and he made a meal for them. They were just, inverted commas, ordinary human beings. I think the Bible would lead us to think one of them was actually the Lord Jesus himself. Just ordinary people visiting an ordinary home, and God was there with that personal touch. Because you see, our God could have provided all of this just with a word. He made everything round about us. So he could have done all this with just a word, but he chose to send somebody to encourage Elijah to hold fast. What am I trying to say here? I'm mean, trying to encourage you to encourage somebody to hold fast by doing something. Angels. It was back in 1981, I found myself in the Royal Infirmary. I've been playing five asides, heart didn't work properly, all the rest is history. But there I was in the middle of the night, and they said, not looking too good, we'll need to do something for you. Oh, thanks so much. Somebody had obviously left a Gideon Bible in my locker at the side of the bed, which I didn't know about. This young lady appeared. It was when Eric Alexander, the great Eric Alexander, was the minister of the Tron Church in Glasgow. This, this young lady, a young nurse, came over and said, are you a Christian? This was before they started doing things. I said, well, actually, I am. How do you know? I said, well, you got a Gideon Bible there. And you know what she did? Every so often she would come over and just hold the arm and say, you're doing fine. And she would speak. Never saw her again. She was a lovely, lovely person. Was she an angel? I don't think so. But but she was there at the right time, at the right place, for the right sort of person. There was another story when Gordon was going through transplant in the Freeman Hospital. He was getting wheeled into theatre. This is at midnight. They do transplants, heart during the night mostly. I couldn't handle it. Agnes, my dear wife, had to go into the priest's room with him. I sat in the corridor. 
This big woman, I mean, that, I don't mean that patronally, she was a big Glasgow woman. Come down and sat beside me and said, he'll be all right. And she said, and you'll be all right too. Here's the thing. I never saw her again. This is absolutely true. I never saw her again. I asked her around the hospital. Tell me, who was that lady? Quite like, don't recognize that. Now, I would get drummed out of some churches for even thinking that. But it's just possible that she was sent by God at the right time to say the right thing. Why do I say all that? Not for any ego story, but this. Make yourself available. Make yourself available to others so that they can hold fast to. You could be that angel to someone. They require care. They require practical help. My aunt is a 101, sharp as a tack, lives by herself. I'll go and see her on the way home today. I'll go and see her every Sunday afternoon. You know what ministry? Text and sending cards. Now, she always texts with capital letters, which I understand means shouting, but she's not really shouting. She just doesn't know how to do mini texts. But she sends texts to folks and basically say, how are you? And they feel guilty because she's 101. They should be doing that to her. She wanders down to the post box and puts cards in the post box to send to people who are ill or are struggling a wee bit. And they feel guilty because they could have sent a card to her and all that. So, and so it was on. But she's not bothered about that. But that's her ministry. Because she's been a Christian for 90 years and some. And she's holding fast. What a reputation to have. And she said, there'll be nobody at my funeral. I said, well, I think there might just be one or two folks there. But you see, that's all it takes. You're doing that to encourage somebody to hold fast. Very quickly, it was a purposeful touch. So are you, are you holding fast today? Are you steadfast in your faith? Are you keeping going? And amongst us, Jim was praying rightly so at the beginning. The little problems, the major problems, it all comes into his family life. So well, that's interesting these days, isn't it? But it's all there. Are we holding fast? Because you see, it was a purposeful touch. And that's what he wants to give to us today, to encourage us to hold fast. Because God wasn't finished with him yet. What a great phrase. You know, whatever vintage we are today, God's not finished with us yet. The fact that we're here today means we're not finished. He gave Elijah a new commission. That's a whole new sermon. Maybe next time, Jim. Anyway, that's beside the point. That's a whole, he gave my new commission. See, we need the tenderness of God to see again his greatness. We sing that lovely old chorus, our God is a great big God with the children. He's higher than a skyscraper. Deeper. Actually, when you think about that, it's tremendous because he is. Our God is a great big God. It moved on. If you read the chapter at home later, you'll find he was feeling really down. He said, I'm the only one left. And God came along and said, Bye. actually, Elijah, there's another 7,000 out there. You're not alone. So keep going. Hold fast. And in verse 19, verse 15, chapter 19, verse 15, he says this, Elijah, go back the way you came and start again. I've got a new job for you. Perhaps this morning, you need to go back. Go back and rejoice in the joy of your salvation. Go back and realize that the God we serve is worth serving. And keep holding fast and keep being steadfast. And if you're in church this morning and you don't know this Jesus, can I encourage you to find out about him? Because I assure you he's worth knowing. And he's worth serving. And he's worth following. And once we do hold fast, he's with us all the time. So let's go back if we need to. And let's keep holding fast. Elijah went on. He turned out yet again to be a great man of God. He slipped back. He wasn't holding fast. But God came along and said, come on, keep going. And he's saying the same to us this morning, all these centuries later. God bless. Thank you, Billy. And... Uh, Right on cue, we have that hymn. Um, don't think Willie knew in advance that we're going to sing that as our final hymn this morning. When I fear my faith will fail, Christ will hold me fast. I often remember um, we had a, a preacher by the name of Peter Donald uh, here 
many years ago and he was uh, going out of the building and somebody said to him, how are you keeping, Peter? He said, I'm not keeping. He says, I'm kept by the power of God. <laughs> and it's, we sometimes worry about our holding on to him and rightly so, but what this hymn is about is he is holding us and we're relying on his work and his security. And the Bible, Jesus said in his word that none shall pluck you out of my hand. And with a double lock and none shall pluck you out of my father's hand. <laughs> and uh, we have that security. He will hold me fast. <laughs> 